Welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for uh, Friday, February 15th, 2013, the Space Rock Edition. So, we, <laughs> I don't know uh, what you guys were all doing last night, but I was reporting uh, nonstop on a meteor that, uh, that exploded over Russia, uh, I guess, last night. And uh, as well as we've got a, a, a huge... Uh, I guess asteroid passing very close to we the Earth. We have a very a, tiny a, asteroid. A huge, a, very <laughs> tiny. A building <laughs> size. Anyway, uh, yeah, an asteroid passing very close <laughs> to the Earth today, uh, which actually just passed us, so it's all safe, everything's fine. So, joining us for this very special Space Rock edition, we've got uh, a team of dedicated astro astronomy journalists. So, we've got uh, Dr. Ian O'Neill from Discovery. We've got uh, Nancy Atkinson from Universe Today. We've got Nicole Gallucci, Dr. Nicole Gallucci, aka the Noisy Astronomer. Dr. Pamela Gay from CosmoQuest. We've got Scott Lewis from CosmoQuest. And we've got uh, Dr. Thad Zabo from uh, Cerritos College. And uh, yeah, and so we had all kinds of stuff we wanted to talk about today. Uh, we wanted to talk about, uh, we wanted to talk about, anyway, comets, Asteroids, other st stuff that's happening on Mars, and all of that just got wiped completely clean last mm -hmm. night with the impact of this uh, of this meteor over over Russia. So, I'm gonna guess that Ian is looking the most sleep deprived, and has probably been the one who has been uh, has been reporting the most uh, busily on the on the actual media that happened in in Russia. So, so let's start, and uh, Ian, I'm gonna give you the uh, the lucky job of giving everyone an update on what happened last night. Oh, but Fraser, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> Why did it fall on me? No, yeah, so, yeah, last night, um, it was, I don't even remember what time it could have happened. It must have been around about 10 o'clock at night, wasn't it? Um, news started coming out of Russia. It was around about 9.30 local time when, uh, when this happened in the morning. And uh, basically a meteor streaked across the sky and, you know, it looked very beautiful. But this thing was big. And a few of the um, eyewitness accounts, I mean, this is the thing. This is probably one thing that struck me the most was there was a huge number of videos that went online almost immediately. You had videos from um, dashboards of, uh, of cars. You had CCTV coverage. You had um, just random observers looking at this cloud in the sky. And basically what happened was this meteor struck streaked through the sky over, over this, uh, this Russian region um, and huge sonic booms sounded out and these sonic booms basically shock waves from where the uh, where the space where the space rock entered the atmosphere um, smashed windows there were very quickly reports about injuries uh, mainly cuts due to glass being blown out and also minor concussions i think that number has now gone up to like a thousand people have been reported to have some kind of injury no no, no deaths that we were aware of yet but it's obviously a major major event and then reports started coming in that there was some sort of meteor shower, but um, experts believe that it was one big object that entered the atmosphere, exploded, scattering uh, meteorites. And there are some uh, accounts where um, where they where they think there's um, land sites of of um, uh, meteorites. Um, so it was a major event, and it apparently affected like three cities. Um, this area, this region, is about uh, 900 miles east of Moscow. And as I say, there was a huge number of videos, and we can probably talk about why there were all these videos a little bit later. But this was, this was huge, and it kept us up for most of the night, I think. Yeah, and I'm sure it was the same. The same sort of thing happened to all of you, which was that I got a tweet, and then I got a text from Pamela, and then I got a bunch of yeah. a bunch of emails, and then it was like a landslide of of information. And you go to Twitter, and you put in meteor. And it was just nonstop stuff. And and when these kinds of events happen, right, the journalist in you is very skeptical and kind of goes, "What? Well, no, come on, you know, we've heard this thing before." And every time that I'm reporting on these stories, I'm always seeing all of these fake pictures, fake video that people are trying to pass up as the real thing for I don't know whatever reason. Um, but in this case, you could just tell right away that there was this consistent set of, of videos that looked very different from anything we'd ever seen, and they were all from these weird dashboard cameras in these Russian cars from different distances and different angles, and so it was, it was quite something to see this all coming together. And I think, Ian, you... So, so I, guess, I guess my first question is, 
what do we know right now? Because as the details were coming in last night, it was it was all kinds of stuff. It was you know it made landfall. It was a, you know it, it exploded really high up. It was big. It was small. It was a it was a meteor shower. It was one object. What do we know right now? Does anyone know sort of what is the current understanding of the of the impact? Yeah, I think I think I've seen um, some reports that uh, they estimate that it's a uh, ten ton object that came through the atmosphere and basically disintegrated on impact of the atmosphere creating the shower of debris or uh, meteorites. Um, but apart from that, I think it's still fairly vague as to where this thing came from and what's actually going on. The, the, one thing that, the, the one thing that has been sorted out is from looking at angle of the sun, angle of the shadows, trajectory across the sky, they've been able to figure out this object came from a completely different distance than the asteroid that passed by the Earth today. These two objects are not at all related, uh, completely different orbital trajectory, and it's just one of those things where these things happen, and it's the one that we don't spot ahead of time that's most likely to get us. Yeah, In terms Sherry. Oh, sorry, I just wanted to, to interject um, sharing a, a, an image made for us by Alice of Alice's Astro Info. Um, she uh, you know, made, made a nice little graphic here of the path of the asteroid as uh, in red and the path of the meteor in yellow. They're completely unrelated, orthogonal to each other. Um, and that's the information that we have right now from all of these videos. Um, so we know they're not related. It's just a coincidence and, and a scary one at that. And, and the annoying thing about this object is as, as you look at the path across the Earth, it, it's traveling from east to west, which means that in the early morning when this occurred, essentially the asteroid came out of, of the region of the sky where the sun happens to be located, which meant that this wasn't picked up by amateur astronomers with giant telescopes, because really this was only going to be seen if you had a giant telescope um, ahead of time. So we really didn't have an opportunity to find this one before it decided to hit. Uh, in terms of damage, um, it looks like the vast, vast majority of the damage, both to buildings and to human beings, came from the shock wave that reverberated through the region. This was caused by the sonic boom of an object moving faster than the speed of sound, passing through our upper atmosphere. That sonic boom um, knocked out windows, knocked out window frames, the glass, it, the, the number of people who've sought medical attention is now up to over 1,100 individuals. Mm -hmm. this, this is vast, vast amounts of damage during the winter right outside of the Ural Mountains. So this, this is something we do need to be very aware of, the human toll caused by a sonic boom. By and, a sonic boom. And, yeah. and in terms of actual falling rocks from the sky, there's a crater in the surface of a lake, there's a zinc factory that appears to be hit, but they're still sorting through all the debris. Um, but the vast majority of this damage is just the sonic boom. But I mean, a 10-ton rock is not a big object. I mean, it would be very difficult to see with, as you said, with a telescope. I mean, that's like a, that's a rock the size of a truck, right? It's not... Right. It's not huge. Yeah, smaller size of, you know, with rocks so dense, it would be the size of a, a large car or like a, like a pickup truck. So that's, that's something. Um, now, we've actually got a video from our friends at The Guardian here that we thought we would, we would show and make sure that I got the audio going. And, uh, and this, is, this is something. So let's, uh, let's run this. Can you put, the, put that up, Nicole? That was air. Yeah. That's ridiculous. That's air. Air. Let's watch, can we watch it one more time? Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
That is well, your pants, yeah. scary. Yeah, yeah the, the, oh, the, 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 we do a lot the of work way... to get that audio coming in, so you can hear that boom. But but the thing to to realize is this wasn't a death from the skies event. This was an oh my god, I need to underwear event. Right. <laughs> and, and I think you should point out that people that peop the majority of the injuries seem to be that people were standing and looking out their window because they could see yeah. the meteor streaking across the sky and then the sonic boom hit and so there were lots of people standing by their windows and then the windows broke so I think the majority of the injuries that I've seen reported anyway are glass cuts from windows right. I mean and, a lot of, like how lightning and thunder works you know we're seeing this happen and we're waiting for the sound to travel and there's just so much energy mm -hmm. going on with it that's causing the air to use so much force and actually blow apart these windows and that's where a lot of those injuries were coming from. I mean, it, it's blowing open doors. It was funny because um, I received a few tweets when, uh, when we were live tweeting this last night and people were saying, oh this can't be real because these guys are outside, they're looking up, they see this cloud in the sky, they're filming it, they're talking and a couple of minutes seem to go by and then suddenly this boom hits them and they said why is there such a delay? And it's like, well, this thing happened really, really high, and it takes that long for the sonic boom to reach the ground. So, you know, as Nancy was saying, people were actually getting near the windows, looking up, you know, being outside. And so that's why they're kind of shocked when it actually hit. Right. And it was, it was, it was like awesome. a 10,000, it was like 10,000 meter altitude, right? Or higher. Or um, higher. Yeah. The one thing I haven't found, and, and I've been looking through, through videos to try and determine this, I haven't seen anybody leave the camera running from the time that the meteor appeared in the sky to the time that the sonic boom hit and that would give us a very good idea it's about uh, um, 57 seconds is one that I so actually it, um, my friend Paul got it came online uh, Dr. Paul Reese um, and started doing some estimates of the energy of the blast using the difference in time between um, the flash and the sonic boom um, that gave the distance away um, he, although uh, his estimate vastly underestimated, um, it turns out what the uh, he gave he gave a good lower limit for how big uh, the, the rock must have been. I think it was at like 300 kilograms. It turns out um, just based on one video, uh, it, it's quite a bit larger than that. And and there are uh, a weather satellite that was able to catch capture both the meteorite and the shadow that it cast and they're able to start to figure out exactly where it was by looking at where the videos were taken and the delay between the flash and the noise and you can thus triangulate it so if it's 57 seconds here if it's 2 minutes 20 seconds over here you start to add up all those different delays and you can figure out exactly spatially where above the surface of the earth has occurred in the exact same way that we can use multiple GPS satellites and the delay to where we are to figure out exactly where we are on the surface of the Earth. Now, Ian, how come that we had so many of these Russian dashboard cameras that were able to provide this video so quickly? Well, that was the thing as well, because, you know, you're watching all these videos and you're thinking, oh, this is a hoax. This is definitely a hoax. Then you see one car. Another car has got a similar view for a different angle. Another car, another car. And it's like all these cars with bloody cameras on them. It was very, very strange. Um, but if you do a little bit of digging and you do a bit of research online, you find that all these you know, Russian car drivers, they're not like storm chasers and they're not actually mounting cameras to their cars to track down meteors on the chance they might see one. This is actually a... Um, a problem, a problem in Russia. Um, apparently, well, it seems hellish on the roads in Russia. Apparently, um, yeah. people deliberately get run over to sue. Um, there's a lot of police corruption, so people like to have video evidence of something that's gone down. They like to have um, video. They like to record everything when they're driving. And apparently, there's like a million of these cameras in cars across Russia. So, if a meteorite was to hit anywhere, Russia is the perfect place for yeah. it because you're going to get a lot of eyewitness right. accounts. So this is by pure luck, but it, they are beautiful um, uh, videos. I mean, these are high definition, good quality videos of this. Uh, in fact, the one key event when the guy's playing music on his morning commute. Can you just imagine seeing that in the sky? I'm surprised he didn't swerve off the road because he, yeah. he kept his cool <laughs> and he kind of <laughs> followed it as it went. And you really got a, a scale. You really had a good idea then um, from like the 
the point of view of a eyewitness. You know, it was it, it's incredible. It's, it's it's similar to like the storm chasers cams you see when they're running down trying to find a tornado, but they're not looking at tornadoes. They're they're not even looking for uh, meteorites. They're just trying to record um, events on their daily. Uh, commute to work, which is probably hard to imagine, like in in the US, where I'm so that probably a camera would be handy on, in the LA roads. But it's um, truth, yes. It, it's, um, it was just an amazing, um, an amazing place for this to happen. To be honest, and it happened over a populated area. So this is this is a warning. I mean, this is an incredible um, shot off the bow. This is like um, a, uh, a flesh wound from the cosmos. Hey, look. There's rocks out here. We, we can you... cause damage, and we didn't even create a crater here. You know, we managed to, you know, yeah. injure over a thousand people. For goodness' sake, with this just this airburst. And and this is Incredible. a small factory town right on the edge of of Siberia, just past yeah. the Ural Mountains. If you look at it in Google Maps, you you go just an hour's drive in any in any direction, and you're in the middle of nowhere. Sparsely populated, and that right. just think that's that's a huge. Imagine if that happened over LA or New York, that would be poor. Right. Can you imagine all the windows going out in New York? <laughs> that wouldn't be pleasant. Yeah, <laughs> There'd be a lot and, more injuries than that. Well, that and, and just well, thinking about the the chaos that would ensue immediately afterward with that many people in such a densely populated area. I mean, luckily it was it was out pretty much in the middle of nowhere. But when you get uh, three cities, isn't exactly the sky, middle of nowhere. What's that? Three small cities isn't exactly middle of nowhere. Well, but I'm thinking with the population density and then also yeah. flashbacks of other events of things flying in the sky and exploding, that would not be a good instance. So it, you know, we really lucked out on the human scale as far as it being out in a smaller town. But if it did happen in a larger town, I think it could have you know, had much more implications. And, and this is three... Hang, hang on, I think we need to stop calling this a smaller town. You look up the population of Shelyabinsk online, it's a million people. Yeah, okay. yeah. This That's is not, not I mean... That's not. It's it's a remote area. There's not much around there. But to consider this just a small town, there's a reason there are this many cameras. There's a reason there were this many drivers. This is a million people. They're going about their morning commute, and then this thing comes in. <laughs> so, <laughs> so does anybody know how often these kinds of events happen? About every forty years. About every forty years, you'll 40 get a, you'll get an air burst yeah. explosion like this that causes this kind of damage. And remember, our planet is, is, is a large surface area of ocean. So if it happens over ocean, it's not going to cause nearly this much damage or maybe even be seen. The other thing is this is probabilistic. I mean, this it mm -hmm. happens on average every 40 years. But that means because it happened today, that doesn't mean there's zero chance of it happening again in the next week. If, you know, it means the chance is very, very small. But there's no way of predicting this. And this is the, the real problem with rocks this size, that they're too small to detect with, with current telescopes or radar or anything. And that it's, it's totally random. And, yeah. and on the list of things that were reported that were not true, uh, one of the things that got reported at a couple of different sites, including RT and Gawker, is that the uh, Russians shot at this thing with an anti-aircraft <laughs> missile. Did not happen. Um, <laughs> that yeah. it was captured by radar. Did not happen. Um, one of the interesting ones was that people were given a warning ahead of time via text message. No, what actually happened is after it occurred, a text message was sent out explaining what had happened. Because, I mean, think about this. You're, you're barely past your first cup of coffee. Some of these people are out on the roads. What, what I loved was the things that people were saying in, in the reporting, it, I, in the recordings. I, I understand some Russian. I couldn't understand everything that was going on. But there was a lot of, huh, I wonder where it's going. And come on, come on, come on. And, and so people were trying to figure out how do we follow this, how do we look at this. And they were driving completely calmly, which is awesome. Kudos to all the Russians. Um, but... But when this happened, they had no understanding. This could have been an airplane crashing. This could have been a surface-to-ground missile. This could have been a nuclear missile. Given light of the testing that North Korea has been doing, all these things were in people's brains lately. And, and I, I have to give massive kudos to the population of this city for not knowing what the expletive is going on and remaining so calm and just sort of, huh, I'm going to put this on YouTube. Yeah, somebody yeah, provided a really handy, UFO. Yeah, somebody provided a really handy Russian translation guide on Twitter and it was things like, you know, OMG, 
you know, and this is <laughs> Russian version. If you hear this, that means the person's saying, oh, my God. So, yeah, it was pretty great. Uh, um, just uh, sharing a comment briefly since we were talking about size. Um, uh, Detlef Kroos says NASA estimates a 15-meter, 7,000-ton object. Um, I'm seeing the same numbers uh, being published on nature.com news. So if you want to, to follow that. Um, again, I think they're just using all the evidence from the videos, um, from the timing to figure out the size of the explosion and then estimating uh, what, um, what mass you have from that kind of energy. Now I know that we've seen uh, some some photographs of like there was a there was a strike in a in a Russian lake where it was like a perfectly circular uh, impact and we've heard heard reports of of debris. You know, does anyone know if that if that's happened? Did the whole thing just obliterate in the sky, or did it actually rain down material? And has any of that been discovered so far? I, I at this point, it's unclear. They have, uh, as near as they can tell, it, it's winter. All the lakes should be frozen. There's a lake that is known not to have a hot spring in it that suddenly has a, a region that is almost perfectly circular cleared at the surface. That is consistent with a expletive hot object hitting the surface of the ice and the heat radiating away in a circle. So you can have something that comes down at an angle but because of the way the energy dissipates, you end up with the circular, in this case, ice-free zone on the surface of a lake rather than a crater. Um, they are searching through the debris of the zinc plant, and there are, from what I've heard, roughly a 1,000 people deployed looking for the debris and also looking for further injuries. In coming days, we'll understand more. And I know that in, um, in past uh, meteorite impacts, they often find them in these frozen lakes. I know in Canada, we've had a few impacts that have happened, and the researchers are able to go out and dig down into the lake and find the dig down into the ice and find these fragments embedded down a couple of you know a couple of meters in the ice and that's fantastic because then they can do a really good scientific analysis on this on these objects before they the, the lake melts and the and the pieces drop into the water so so hopefully someone's going to find some of this debris and be able to start studying it and get a better handle on on the composition of the the asteroid and so on so so, so I'm, I mean, we promised sort of two asteroid conversations. So, uh, did anybody have anything else they wanted to talk about or speculate or answer any questions on that? On that first, we can always come back around when we we think of something. But, but we just passed the flyby of asteroid 2012 DA14, and so I thought we would we would talk about that as well. So, I so I said a quick reminder of how people can uh, get a hold of us too. So on Twitter. <laughs> We're using um, the hashtag Space Hangouts. You can leave us comments on YouTube, on the event page on Google+. Plus. Um, also, on any of the shares going out on Google+, Plus as well, we are tracking those comments going out there. So please feel free to get a hold of us, ask us questions, and uh, make any comments on, this, you know, on the awesome science news that's happening. Just to let you know, the comments are coming in a lot faster than they usually do on most <laughs> weeks. So we are trying our best to keep up. But thank yes. you, thank you, thank you. This is awesome. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk about 2012 DA14, and we have been covering, this was one that we did have a warning about, and we have been covering this, I know, on Universe Today quite a bit, so I don't know, Nancy, were you working on a few stories for that? Yeah, yeah, we talked about it, how it, uh, it just whizzed by about an hour ago, uh, and it's now on its way out, so... So, uh, so what's the backstory on this rock? Well, it was discovered about a year ago, and uh, so so we have known about it, and I think it's the largest, uh, or actually the closest meteor or asteroid of that size that we've known about for, for ahead of time that's going to pass that close. So, uh, you know, they've had a chance to just really uh, determine its orbit really well. And then, of course, um, they're, you know, putting the full artillery of, uh, of uh, radar and, any, and, and optical telescopes looking at this thing just to try to find out as much about it as we can. And so how large was it? Uh, it is about about half the size of a football field, so uh, 50 meters, 164 feet. Um, and, uh, you know, so it was not visible in the uh, for North America, but I think uh, Australia and New Zealand and Africa and uh, Eastern Europe got a good good look at it. With the, if if you had a good sized telescope, well, and the other problem was this 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 one 
was moving so fast that unless you had very specialized gear, you couldn't track it live, or unless you were using a very large field view, large aperture device, and those combinations aren't very common. Um, one also really cool thing to note is this was discovered by Spanish amateur astronomers who were working using funding that they received from the Planetary Society. So. You know, there's plenty of awesome stuff that can be done by amateur astronomers just using the equipment they have to do amazing science. And so can we put this into context? Uh, I don't know, Ian, I don't know if you worked on the story at all, but how, how common are, are objects like th of this size that pass this close to us? Um, well, passing this close, this is um, a rarity. And in fact, um, since, we, since modern um, surveys for asteroids, this is the closest something of this size has passed by. So this is like a, an amazing opportunity for scientists. I mean, obviously, very early on, we worked out it wasn't going to hit us, but it was going to come very, very close. So you kind of calm down a bit and think, okay, well, yeah, it's, it's kind of scary if it was on a, a collision course because this thing could take out a city if it did hit, hit, the, hit the surface. Um, but this is more of a um, scientific opportunity. And as already said, there's a lot of optical telescopes and there was this the live broadcast just now from NASA JPL, they're they covering it. And it, all it looked like was a little dot going through. It almost, it almost just looked like a satellite you would see going overhead, you know, a little pinprick of light. So really that's all the optical um, observatories would see. Um, but down the road from me, at, uh, Goldstone uh, um, ra uh, radio antenna, that they are, I think they're pinging it with, oh, um, oh. with radio waves. Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually wrote about this for you, Ian. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you tell the details. I'll let you explain the details there. I get excited because it has a radio telescope. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I reserve the next spot for Nicole because she really, really, really <laughs> oh, fine. Um, but yeah, so basically, this is a perfect opportunity for um, radio antenna to, to um, see this thing. But with the radio, with uh, with the radar, they're able to get really fine detail of the surface. So although optical telescopes are great and you're able to see it pass by, it's the really the the radar um, imagery that I'm really looking forward to seeing, especially from Goldstone. And I pass over to Nicole. Nicole, yeah. tell us about the the radio observations that that were being made. So, uh, so. I have been particularly interested in the observations they're doing between um, Goldstone. So they're shooting, they're shooting radio waves at the asteroid uh, with the Goldstone radar. Uh, I apologize, by the way, for the delay in my video and audio. Um, I realize it's somewhat distracting, but um, I'll try and screen share something interesting. Uh, <laughs> so they're they're actually going to hit it with radio waves and detect it with using the very large array in New Mexico. Uh, and two of the very long baseline array antennas in New Mexico. There's one at Los Alamos, and there's one at, in Pie Town, which is actually known for really good pies. Um, and so they're doing this interferometric observation, and from this observation, they can tell in what direction the asteroid is spinning, and they can actually figure out uh, how the asteroid is spinning, and the way that it's spinning affects its orbit in the future. So we'll be able to tell how it's going to deviate from its orbit in by very small amounts using these observations um, of the asteroid spin using radio, using the radar from Goldstone and the radio telescopes in New Mexico. They're actually, uh, in, they're not getting a straight up image of it from, from those observations. Uh, and NASA will be getting radar observations, as, uh, images as well. But uh, they're watching these speckles and the way that these, these reflections, these speckles uh, move and they can catch the very fast rotation and its direction by doing that. It's a really funky, weird uh, uh, technique that they're using, which is uh, really interesting. And so, I mean, do they know the composition of this one? Is it rock? Is it iron? I don't know. Yeah. You, I mean, you I guess these observations will really help them tell, especially as it, as it gets distorted by the gravity of the Earth, right? You, you can only start to understand the composition of these objects by making assumptions based on how they reflect light. And it, so basically a darker object will have a different composition than a brighter object. In order to make sense of how bright or dark it is, you need to know exactly how big it is. The radar is going to get us there. Now, uh, now, we had been telling people you know, for weeks in advance, there was absolutely no risk of this thing striking the Earth. Everything's safe. Don't worry about it. And now, obviously, we're a couple of hours after its closest pass, and still we're all fine. Safe. We're all fine. We're all safe. You know, another meteor asked, yeah, another right. asteroid Russia. hit us. But that's that's completed. Don't worry <laughs> about that. Ill-timed coincidence. Yeah. Ill -timed yeah, coincidence. Seriously. Yeah, that is. That's going to make our lives a little busy, isn't it? Um, <laughs> but are we gonna? Is there any risk of this object in the future? 
Well, that's where we need to understand how its rotation is go is is going on. It clearly does cross the Earth's orbit. Um, we'll be able to figure that stuff out. Right now, we have no known risk of it. Um, so it's all going to depend on, is its orbit going to get dramatically altered by the effects of sunlight heating it and changing its orbit? Yeah, I think the, uh, the next uh, close approach is going to be in 30 years' time, but it's not going to come as close as this. So, and they can probably, they, I think they can track it out to about 100 years into the future before uncertainties start coming in. But, um, but yeah, yeah, 30 years, I think, is the next close approach. But its, it's orbit is going to be modified so much that uh, Earth's gravity is going to cause its, its orbital period to slow to, to be shortened by 51 days. So that's how close it's coming. It's literally skipping off the edge of our gravitational well, and we're sending on a different orbit. So we bought Doomsday to the asteroid this time. And there's also, the, there's also a study into um, asteroid quakes. They're actually going to be yeah. looking for evidence of perhaps our gravitational field has caused some sort of adjustment on the, on the surface of the asteroid. And so I suppose, you know, radar um, observations will help and also a change in brightening of the, of the asteroid to show whether it kicked up some dust as it went past. Um, so, but that would be really, really cool because that, that will really help us understand A, what it's made of and B, how these asteroids interact with gravitational fields of planets. And if I understand them. correctly, oh, this is a pretty rare event. I mean, the fact to have an asteroid come this close, um, you know, within the orbit of the geosynchronous satellites is actually really quite a rare event. How often to does this happen? That actually happens fairly often. We've, we've had several recently that came within the distance of geosynchronous orbits. It's just the size of this one. Yeah. Yeah, the this size is and the closest. Sized. It, it, isn't, isn't it Tunguska sized in yes. terms of impact energy? Yes. Um, and somebody just pointed out, and I, these are going too fast for me to keep up, uh, that, oh, Sylvan Wispy says uh, it's about 40 times the volume of the Russian asteroid, uh, if those initial estimates are correct. Um, and so, yeah, you can you can extrapolate beyond that what the energy of the impact is. And and that was, I guess, the second question is it, it's not going to hit. It's not going to hit in the known future. But if it did hit, uh, it, what kind of yeah, what kind of an of an impact event would we be seeing? One thing that's going to be important for this is getting some measure of the density. If it is made of rock, that's much lower density and that's much lower mass than if it's made of iron. If you look at Meteor Crater in Arizona, that was made by about a 50 meter diameter object, but we know it to be largely iron. And so you can see this mile wide crater in northern Arizona that this thing left about 50,000 years ago. The other problem is, and kind of what we saw from the event over Russia earlier today is this air blast that happens. So it's not just the impact from something like this. When that air is forced ahead of it, that blast of wind is going at 500 miles an hour or faster. You consider that the strongest tornadoes that we have on record put out a wind speed of about 300 miles an hour. So you can imagine the damage ahead of <coughs> this kind of air blast from something this large forcing that much air out. If you look at Tunguska, that's 800 square miles of trees that were blasted to the ground. So extrapolate to someplace where it's, where it's a populated area. It's not a pretty picture. Yeah. And, and the composition is a very important thing to think about because the way it does or doesn't uh, shatter, blow up, choose whatever verb you want in the atmosphere is related to what it's made of. Something that's solid lead is going to pass through the, uh, the atmosphere very differently from something that's a loosely held together rocky asteroid. Uh, mm -hmm. So we, we're facing the difference between losing most of its energy in the upper atmosphere and creating a hole on the surface of the Earth. I'm holding up an iron uh, meteorite that uh, Fraser gave me. Is it? <laughs> Thank you, Fraser. Um, and yeah, it's such a tiny little thing, but it's it's really heavy for its size. Yeah. And I wish I could ha I wish I could pass it around the hangout and and pass it around to our viewers, but it doesn't work that way because uh, I do that in live demos. But you know, this is a hefty little thing. Uh, so if it is mostly iron like that, as 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 um, I don't know what percentage of meteorites are. Um, in Not very. Are. Not it's very many. Kind of small, it's, right? yeah. yeah, it's it's a typically estimated between about one and three percent are okay. actually iron. The processes for forming an iron asteroid or iron meteorite uh, you have are to much form rarer a whole to occur. Basically. Exactly. Yeah. Have exactly. It to you have there to we go. Into the center. Yeah. And then have Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> 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 and so and so, how often do those Tunguska level events happen? I mean, that's like once every 
thousand years? Was it's once well, every few hundred to a thousand yeah. years, apparently. Years to a thousand but, years. Uh, you know, as Stad was saying, that is pretty statistical. But it's not, it's not on a clock like that. I mean, it's... No, it's not. It's, we're not due one in in, in 900 years, but it, yeah. it could happen tomorrow. Well, we'd probably see it way before, so it won't happen tomorrow. But, yeah. it, you know, on average, it will happen that amount of time. But, you know, you could have a cluster of them. Who knows? Yeah, this is what's called stochastic events, where you might have an average number of them, but just like... Uh, when guests arrive to a party, they might arrive plus or minus 15 minutes or more like plus plus 45 minutes of when the start time for the party is, but they do tend to arrive in clumps. With this, it's it's completely randomized within, we know, on average, but we can't say exactly when. We can't say when we're overdue. And over time, as we do clear out our solar system, the probability of these things happening decrease in ways that we don't fully understand yet. So how many of these objects have we actually identified their location and their size? How many of them have we mapped out, these, these dangerous ones? There's a list at the end of the page when you go to spaceweather.com, and it yeah. says it's currently about 1,200 near-Earth asteroids of, I think, 50 meters in size or larger. We have also have another limit that was put on in place by the, uh, the WISE um, uh, telescope, the, the Wide Infrared Survey Explorer, um, about how many of these things are out there, 50 meters or larger. And the kind of scary thing about that is we've only detected about 10% yeah. of them, according yeah, to uh, yeah. the WISE and, survey. And, and the Russian meteor, I saw an estimate that they think we've only detected about 1% of things that size. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot more little things. That's the way nature kind of makes yeah, things. And, and this right. is part of the justification for building the large synoptic survey telescope is this is a very large mirror that's going to be surveying the sky on a regular basis and able to find smaller objects orbiting our sun and potentially orbiting into us in the future. And, and so part of the justification for the massive expenditures going to fund this telescope is, well, helping to keep us safe, helping to find these objects when the time skills allow us to still protect ourselves by deviating the asteroid's orbits in one way or another. Yeah, because one year for the discovery of this uh, 2012 uh, DA14, a year to do something about this. If, if, if say, now, you know, this, say, say if that, asteroid was going to hit us and it was on a collision course. What can we really do in a year? I mean, right. obviously everybody thinks, you know, fire some nukes at it, but we don't really understand its composition and we don't understand what will happen if we fire a nuke at these, this thing. But yeah. how else can we, how else can we affect its, its trajectory? We can't, mm. we'd probably get hit. So, yeah. I mean, uh, is there any world government that would be okay with that? Well, they'd have to just suck it up and then hopefully protect against the next one. And so, but I mean, you know, looking at the two objects that we've been talking about today, I mean, with the first one, it's so small, there is essentially no possible way to prevent or predict those kinds of objects Yet. Coming. Yet. Yet. I mean, I, again, as, as we get bigger dishes online, looking at more of the sky, bigger optics, looking at more of the sky on a study survey basis, we will start to detect these things, not necessarily enough ahead of time, but maybe enough to get people to safety. I Do you remember think the, we're going to need a bigger scope? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember the Sudanese um, um, impact? Uh, was it in 2009, the Sudanese? Um, no, that one uh -huh. I don't. Yeah. Um, yeah, and they, managed, they actually managed to get uh, little bits of rock from the desert. Um, yeah. They were able to actually retrieve it. Because that was the first time. I think that was probably a two-meter wide space rock. It was very, it was very, very small. Um, but I think that was the first time ever that we were able to detect... Um, an asteroid, I think it was only a day in advance, so it wasn't a lot of time. Um, but they were able to detect it, work out where it was going to hit, and get recovery teams to that site, because it was actually it happened over the desert, so there weren't many eyewitnesses of this. So we are getting better at detecting these things, but of course, you know, a day notice for a two-meter-wide asteroid isn't really um, neither here nor there. Um, mm. But, you know, it's, there's this horrible... Um, gray area where there are asteroids like 2012 uh, DA14 which are small enough to go unprotected uh, undetected for long periods of time but big enough to take out a city yeah um, we're not talking apocalyptic scale here we're talking something that can really mess with a country's day or a region's day or if it went into an ocean perhaps it may cause some serious tsunami action so th th they are they are dangerous on a local scale and they're worth doing something about, but we can't detect them until very, very late. So as Pamela was saying, we need to get bigger telescopes 
that's all we that's what we need to that's what we need to work on. And yeah. also some more involvement that's going to be important in the future. So Pamela was talking about the LSST, which I think is scheduled to come online in 2022 or 2023. This thing is going to produce 16 terabytes of data a night. So if you want to get involved in citizen science, if you want to donate computer time yeah. to a good cause, when this, this thing comes it. online, it's going to start farming out all of this data so that way you can do this this massively parallel computation like is done with Einstein at home or SETI, SETI at home. That will be a good thing to donate those cycles of your computer for when uh, you're not playing solitaire or checking Facebook on it. So, and, and I think there's another great organization, which is the B612 Foundation, which is mm -hmm. uh, led by Edward Liu and uh, Rusty Schweikert. And they're attempting to, you know, get a mission going that would actually, the, uh, the, oh, sorry, they're setting up a, they want to set up a telescope array called Sentinel, and then ideally be able to actually go out and, and reach out to one of these asteroids, land a, you know, land a probe on it, get to understand them better, and ideally come up with a really viable approach for being able to prevent these these asteroids from doing us any damage in the future. So, you know, you can imagine this future where we've got a really good survey going on all the time of the sky matched with legitimate methodologies for being able to actually prevent these asteroids if we detect anything that's dangerous. It, so. it is a bit terrifying, though. I, I was at the Europlanet meeting uh, last, I believe, October in Spain, and I remember hearing some graduate students from Russia talking about plans to potentially test technologies for diverting asteroids. Now, that's something you don't want to screw up. And and so as as we move forward, we have to be worried about what sorts of accidents could happen in the future, especially as we start considering um, mining, which would would change the moment of inertia of these objects, and so many other different potential futures. Uh, we think that industrial accidents are bad today. Imagine a future where your industrial accident involves an asteroid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want to clarify based on some of the questions that we're seeing. We're not. Um having any effect on 2012 DA 14 right now. Um, we're shooting, you know, we're bouncing radio, radio, radio waves yeah. off of it that's not affecting the orbit. No. Um, however, it, the, the small effects to the orbit um, due to its spin are because of solar radiation and the way that it heats up the asteroid. If it's spinning one way into its orbit or away from its orbit, that can slow it down or speed it up. Um, it's called the Yarkovsky Drift. Um, and so that's the thing that they're looking for. Um, so there are really subtle effects that are can affect the orbits that we don't even think about. It's not not even our our nukes and our mining uh, things that we have no control over. All right, we don't need Bruce Willis for this. Uh, the, the cosmos yeah. takes care of it. But Scott, I don't want to miss a thing. I know. <laughs> I don't want to miss a thing either. Oh, so I think we've just got a few minutes left. So why don't we see if there were any uh, were there any questions? Were there any pictures? Anything else anybody else wanted to add? There are before lots. We, uh, oh yeah. I was just yeah. saying, lots and lots of comments um, coming in on the event page and the YouTube page uh, that we can't get to all of you, which is sad. Uh, Mike Justice uh, points out a link to. D star directed energy solar and it just scrolled down. <laughs> directed energy solar targeting of asteroids and exploration of projects. Uh, one such project that is thinking about ways to uh, deflect an incoming rock. Yeah, we actually did a, a pretty neat story. I know Nancy worked on that where she went on a big rundown on every single possible uh, method that's been conceived so far on how to deflect or move an asteroid. And there's actually a lot of great ideas of gravity tractor beams and, you know, painting them. And uh, there's a lot of great ideas. It's just a matter of getting that infrastructure going. Right. And paying for it. And, pay and yeah, paying for that's it. That's the real yeah. problem. Did, right. I, did anyone see that poster? It was like an infographic that uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson did a Twitter, did a tweet to today. It was something like, you know, asteroids are the universe's yeah. way of asking you how your space program's going. He actually going. tweeted it yesterday. Yeah. Or the yeah. Russian media. Oh, before the Russian one, yeah. <laughs> and it got retweeted a lot more. Yeah. Yeah, yeah um, I thought that was fantastic. We have a question from Felina uh, asking, she, she noted, uh, he noted there was a, a few unreliable reports of another meteor incident in Cuba. Has anybody heard of that? I, I was just I, looking into it while we were in the Hangouts. Yes. I saw a comment too, and I'm not seeing any real corroboration. I'm seeing a lot of the same story being repeated on no-name sites, so okay. I can't I, confirm I, it. I heard Phil discussing it right before we went on air on his Hangout, and he was saying, no, this, this appears to be a hoax, especially when you start to consider which sides of the planet we're facing when 
facing where when this all occurred. Um, but but just as a reminder, Thelina is with Astronomers Without Borders, who often does help facilitate observations of these things. Yeah, he's he's awesome. We're gonna yeah yay. <laughs> yeah. And you just, and you just mentioned that, and I think we should mention that Phil Plate just did like an hour. And, he might still be going. I have no idea. Uh, but he did a great <laughs> hangout. Started a, a couple of hours ago, and has just gone solo for for hours and sort of answering everyone's questions and posting links and pictures and stuff. And if he's finished, then by all means, if you want to get more information, uh, Phil style, uh, by all means, go check out Phil, Phil Plate's uh, post in his, in his stream on, uh, on Google+. Plus. It's fantastic. And then also the Planetary Society did live coverage of the, uh, <clears throat> of the close pass of 2012 DA14. And I'm sure they talked about the, uh, the Russian meteor as well. I didn't get a chance to see that. Yeah, and that they just wrapped up just before we did. Right, Dr. Bruce Betts and uh, Bill Nye were in there. They yeah. were discussing the how they weren't related between the uh, 2012 DA14 and yeah. the Russian impact. But you know, it, it, it's a good wake-up call of hey, it's we we get to see things pass by us with a year's warning, or you know, 12 hours beforehand, you can have things explode. So and with no warning, with yeah. no yeah. warning yeah. whatsoever. So if you want to follow this, uh, you know this conversation a lot deeper both of those are great resources and they'll you can keep you going for for hours and hours and hours and I know we're gonna be covering this like crazy on universe today I know that Ian and his team will be on over on discover and the rest of the uh, the rest of the uh, the science journalists are going to be keeping pretty busy on this so I think we're, we're sort of nearing the end of our of our hour so why don't we we've handled a bunch of questions so why don't we start wrapping things up uh, does anyone have any sort of last comments questions or anything to say no one random weird promotional. Um, I'm going to be on the Nat Geo channel tonight at 11.30 Eastern on their uh, Top Secrets Doomsday episode where I talk about asteroids hitting the Earth, and the timing of this thoroughly freaks me out. <laughs> did, did they time in... it because of the asteroid? I, I, I suspect that they timed it due to the asteroid, okay. but nonetheless, the whole Russian meteor incident yeah. on I don't know, top of it. I think you it. and Neil are in cahoots about something going on now. <laughs> First his tweet, now your show. Mm. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> you know, so so tune in eleven thirty Eastern, ten uh, ten uh, Central. Check your local listings. And I guess uh, just kind of a, a, a little admonition to, to people out there: stay vigilant with against conspiracy theories with yeah. all of this. There is a lot of garbage that comes around when all of this comes. You keep keep your skepticism, eyes and ears, you know, ready to to filter th through all of this because. Wow, we're just getting bombarded all over the place <laughs> right right now. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. As soon as Nicole let me know last night, you know, you you get flooded. You're inundated with so much information, and you do have to sift through it before you you know before we can report on it or anything like yeah. that. Yeah. And, and kudos some... to Nicole for waking the two of us up, and then yes. getting Fraser involved as well downstream. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I yeah, mean, she's good. the noisy astronomer for a reason. She's like, wake up now. <laughs> I was <laughs> <laughs> on Twitter, and, you know, and, and I start seeing these videos. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I will say no alarm has ever been as effective as a text message that says, get on the internet, Russian media unfolding. <laughs> <laughs> Dear yeah. Lord, what's yeah. happening? <laughs> um, okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Now, Nancy Welcome. Atkinson had to drop out, but of course you can read more of Nancy's work over on universetoday.com. Uh, Ian O'Neill, where do we find more Ian O'Neill? Um, on discoverynews.com. We've got a funky new website that we were slaving on. That's why I haven't been coming to the Hangouts. So I apologize. Um, but we're gradually you know, getting there. There's, it's just covered with space rocks right now. It's ridiculous <laughs> how much space rocks are going on on Discovery News. So get over there. You'll love it. Um, awesome. But yeah, otherwise, on Twitter, Astro Engine. You can find me there. And Nicole, where do we find more of the uh, of the noisy astronomer? Apparently, I'm noisy enough that you hear from me wherever I go. Yeah, I get text. So we get text messages not from you. About yeah. it. <laughs> the sonic <laughs> boom is not as destructive, though. <laughs> I'm not as destructive. Thank you. I think. Um, <laughs> CosmoQuest, uh, noisyastronomer.com. I blog for Ian. Ian, what side is he on? Over on Discovery, uh, and yeah. Oh, and I blog over on Skeptic as well. And awesome. you blog on CosmoQuest.org. I blog on CosmoQuest, but I work on CosmoQuest, so I do many things on CosmoQuest. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Speaking of CosmoQuest, Dr. Pamela Gay. You can find me at CosmoQuest.org, at Starstrider.com, which I don't use as much as I should. Um, but mostly you can find me on Twitter and Google+.
And don't forget our lovely podcast, Astronomy That's Cast. That's true. Astronomy Cast every Monday afternoon. Uh, so tune in at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific, and catch Fraser and I sharing what we know and how we know it about our universe. And Scott Lewis. I am Bald Astronomer on Twitter. I am also with Cosmo Quest. So um, join us over on the forums there, too. I'm Know the Cosmos. Uh, my website is knowthecosmos.com. And uh, Thad, where do we find out more Thad? So uh, Google Plus primarily. I also am on Twitter as AstroThad. Um, also, you can find me with the virtual star parties, providing commentary there. And I guess I gotta, you know, start writing some stuff other than just these posts on Google Plus and, and get them out here somewhere. I'll so, get you hooked up over at Cosmo Quest. Well, you okay. and you and don't okay. worry, we got we got some work for you at Universe today. So sounds good. Um, and so speaking of uh, the virtual star party, we're going to be doing our virtual star party on Sunday night around, what, it was 7-ish still? Is it still 7, yeah, seven Pacific, 10 seven Eastern? Pacific. Yeah, so as soon as it gets dark on the West Coast, when the when Stuart tells us that he's you know got good dark skies, that's when we start. So, yes. yeah, and we'll be showing you live views of the night sky, whatever planets are up, the moon, and deep sky objects, and we'll stick around for an the hour. A much and... more peaceful night sky. Yeah, a much more. Without <laughs> things exploding and no, no exploding. skipping past. Yeah. Again, so stochastic. We we can't tell. <laughs> we don't know. Sure. So. We might get something happen. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining. Thanks, everybody, for watching. And we will see you all uh, either Sunday or next week. See you. Bye. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Stay calm. Yeah. <laughs> don't panic.